uh, the preface and proper preface. So we, if you got the worksheet or the handout with my rough notes, unedited, um, entirely unedited, either, either, either by anybody or me even. Uh, but that's what we'll use to go through. Number 20, the preface and the proper preface. We did finish last time with the service of the word, and we've entered now the service of the sacrament. Um, we'll, we'll do today mostly the introductory things, and next week probably get hopefully to the words of institution, but we'll be as brief as we can here. Number 20, if you got a worksheet that starts with, it's on both sides, but on one side is a 20. You were dreaming if you thought that I was going to take a whole weekend or something and write up all these notes and have it to you in nice, nice and neat. Um, I just sort of pile one on top of another. But when you're all done, in theory, you could put them all next to each other and you have a little booklet of completely random, unedited notes with mistakes and everything. But you'd have the booklet. <laughs> Um, we begin now the service of the sacrament. Um, so if, if in the ancient church we were doing this, this is the point at which there would have been, I don't know, it, you wouldn't call it an intermission, but this is the point at which um, any of the catechumens or visitors would be invited to leave um, or instructed to leave at this point. And only confirmed members uh, would be, then be staying in the service for communion. It was quite literally closed communion, they would even say, bar the doors or close the doors or something at this point. So th there's a little bit, there's something that happens when we begin the preface, <coughs> um, whereas before you'd have visitors around and things, and but now w we would, s I don't know, I don't, maybe this is b a bad example, I don't, but, but it, it'd be like a, a, if at Thanksgiving you, we had, we had guests that came and in-laws and everybody was here and things, but then you know, a afterwards, we're going to have a family meeting, and this is just the family. And so in-laws, uh, guests, all of you are free to go watch TV. We're going to have our own meeting. Uh, this is just our family here. Well, that's the, in a sense, that's what the Lord's Supper is. We're gathered here uh, together as a, a very, very close family to enjoy a meal together of the Lord Jesus Christ, which he gives to us. And so th the way we started is the preface and the proper preface. I don't know if you've got your, I, I suppose, we, the problem is is that we were handing out hymnals, weren't we? And then I didn't use it for a week or two, and now we don't have hymnals. But it would be useful to be able to look at the hymnals um, if you happen to have a personal hymnal or something like that. Um, the, the, pr the preface and the pr proper preface are on page number 194. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Okay, so the sentences that we're using here, well, let me get a, a handout. Letter A, these introductory sentences are generally acknowledged to be the very oldest component of the liturgy. Now, isn't that interesting? Uh, it'd be hard to know if they go all the way back to the apostles, but we're talking early 200s that they're certainly being used, but they're being talked about in the early 200s by like Hippolytus as, as already being very old at that point. Now, if they're already old and nobody can even remember when they began in the early 200s, right, then this could go back a long ways. This could get really close to the apostles and maybe even back to the first century, um, that, these sentences. So it's really disheartening for me if I go to church someplace and these sentences, th th what we're talking about in particular is the Lord be with you and with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up unto the Lord. It is meet and right, or is good and right, to give him thanks. Or, or let us give thanks unto the Lord. It is meet and right so to do, or to give him thanks. Those three interchanges constitute the oldest part of the liturgy as we have them. And so just to not have them is so, it was just so strange. Um, we, we, we should always have those prior to communion. Letter B, it seems the main emphasis of the preface is our thankfulness. To God for his gifts that he both has given us through his son and the gifts that he is going to give us in his body and blood. All right, let her see this thankfulness is modeled from the Lord's own giving of thanks prior to communion at the institution. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. So we're, it's noted in particular that when Jesus took communion or gave communion for the first time, that he himself thanked God in particular. And that's what we're modeling here. Uh, uh, when it says, uh, let us give thanks unto the Lord our God, it is right to give him thanks and praise, that's what we're doing. While this is not the chief matter in communion, and it's not, 
Thanksgiving was always considered important in the Lord's Supper, and that's why one of the oldest names given to the communion was, in fact, the Eucharist. That word Eucharist, eukareo, simply means give thanks or giving the, the giving of thanks or thanksgiving. So th I, there'd be no offense here if, um, if you were to call the Lord's Supper the Eucharist. That's an old, old title. Maybe older. I mean, you have the breaking of bread and you have the Lord's Supper, which is in the Bible. Um, communion comes later, um, uh, Holy Communion. But the Eucharist, while well, you've got a reference to it in 1 Corinthians 11, I think, or a veiled kind of reference, um, is a really, really old title. So we don't have any trouble... If I'm talking to a Roman Catholic and I say, did you take the Eucharist this week or something in the Mass, that, that's, no, that's no trouble. Um, okay, letter D. The Lord, uh, this is the interchange. The Lord uh, be with you, sorry. And with thy spirit is the response. Now, like before, these words, at least as I read them and my study would indicate this, uh, these words authorize the pastor to conduct the service of the sacrament. Now, wh where do these words come before? I mean, we've, se we've seen these words, the Lord be with you and with your spirit. Wh where, where did we have those first? Question? Well, wait a minute. I have a question, and uh, what I'm expecting is answers. <laughs> where did we, the Lord be with you and with your spirit, where, where, did that f where was that first in the, in the community? The, 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 the salutation right before the? Collect and and when we we said at that time that what in effect is happening is that the Lord is or the, excuse me the Lord the pa really excuse me but the pastor is, is is in a sense asking for authorization to pray on behalf of the entire congregation and the congregation is now saying and with your spirit go ahead pray the prayer on our behalf um, we authorize you to do this and it's been called something like a mini what you remember. A mini what? So, I got a third of you with the word on your lips, but you're unwilling to speak it. A mini ordination. A mini ordination. Take courage. Oh, gosh, look at this. Ugh. Okay, so I'm d I just thought I'd check, and of course, I probably should know because now I'm disappointed. This, g and I should have known this anyway because this is, this is the way it is. It, uh, the setting three is right. It should say, and with your spirit, and with thy spirit. So now we have, remember, I was frustrated because we've changed this so much, and sure enough, in the service of the sacrament and setting one today, I'd have said, the Lord be with you, and you'd have said, and also with you. <laughs> it's like, and that turns it into a greeting. It, it, it loses its theological punch. And really what I think is happening when you say, when I say the Lord be with you. And oh yeah, and with you too. Well, we already said that earlier. Like this is, uh, oh, yeah, okay. This is the second time you've said hello today. Um, but what's in fact going on is that the congregation is again authorizing the pastor to kind of take the reins and to, to conduct the service of Holy Communion at this point. The first thing then that he does is he says, lift up your hearts. Uh, letter E in your handout. <coughs> we lift them to the Lord. Uh, this is a common language, especially in the Psalms. That's where you'll find that lifting up your heart to the Lord and so forth. It, in effect, means that we are ceasing to bow our heads in shame or guilt. That, from my reading of these things in the Psalms, lifting up your head means to no longer be discouraged by your enemies, or by your sins, or by the devil, lift up your heads and lift them up what? To whom? To the Lord. And what that is specifically, that would mean to trust him, to take refuge in him, to set your hearts and minds upon the Lord and not upon the mundane things of the world like my guilt and sin, which is conquered. Okay. So also the language is mirrored in Colossians chapter 3, verse 2, set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Lift up your hearts. That's, this, is, this does not mean that we're kind of, like I'm saying, lift up your hearts off to heavenly things far, far away. Uh, but Jesus himself is coming to be present. So this isn't a distant, distance thing. Uh, stop looking at just what you can see here and think about angels in heaven or something. The angels in heaven and Jesus are here with us now. 
the lift up your hearts as a theological reality, I'm not going to be discouraged anymore. I'm setting aside kind of thoughts about um, wh what dinner am I going to have today or what, do, what am I wearing or something unto the holy things of God, in particular the gifts that he's given to us. So I, get, I, I would suppose that the ancient church thought this was a good opportunity after people had kind of left, the doors are closed, they're starting the Lord's Supper, to say, focus. Yeah, it's time to focus, take your hearts and minds away from your sins and set them upon Christ. So lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. And the first thing then is in letter E, lift, uh, uh, letter F, excuse me. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. And then the response, it is my meet and right so to do, it's proper and right so to do. This prepares us for the proper preface, which follows, because what we're saying here is it's time to give thanks to the Lord. And then the, pre the proper preface is just a giant thanksgiving to the Lord. Uh, yes, Rita, you had your hand. I just was going to say, as a kid, I thought of meat as in M E A T. It is meat. <laughs> you know, and I thought, that's a weird thing to say, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. There's something that the word meat uh, carries that proper doesn't. I don't know why, but. Well, I think that somebody explained it to me eventually. And setting one does. Setting, you know, setting one says, well, the people today are. Um, they, they just aren't sophisticated, and you can't use that kind of language, meat. What does that even mean? Um, so we need to change it to put it into their heart language and so forth. It is right to give him thanks and praise. Okay, fine. Yeah, I mean, you don't lose a bunch. But as you, as you can probably tell, in my view, we, we don't need to change the language to adjust to people. I, uh, what we do is adjust the people to the ancient language. And you all know that because you pray the Lord's Prayer and don't change the language. Thy kingdom come. Nobody's submitting to your kingdom come, your will be done. You, it's fine to say thy will be done. It's the same thing in Amazing Grace and all the most beloved old hymns and prayers that you've come to know. You would not submit to their being changed, not for a second. You would say, but that's not as beautiful anymore. So I don't know these theologians who always want to change things to make it easier for you to understand. Um, just teach. Teach. It's meat. So meat, children, does not mean your hamburger. It means it's right, it's proper, it's dutiful even, it's noble, something like that. It's not spelled, spelled like hamburger. It's right. Yeah. <laughs> Look at your spelling. Is it different spelling? You could learn your multi-letter phonograms. <laughs> <laughs> but when you're little, sometimes you, you know. Um, letter G. It's called the proper pre preface, not prefect, preface because there's a distinct preface for each season of the year. Now, unfortunately, these are not written out in our hymnal as we have them, like they were in TLH. The red hymnal has these. Or in LW, L, uh, the Lutheran with blue hymnal has the proper prefaces, so you could have followed along with if you wanted. The, the hymnal as we have it, like today, for instance, if you're looking at it, it's at the bottom of the page, and it's just, it is truly meet, right, and salutary, dot, dot, dot. And I'm supposed to then have the words, which I do on, on my book, but you don't have them. The, when this get, get like later on, if you're trying to study this, then it makes it harder because you, get, you don't have the words. You have to go to church and go into the chancel and find them. But if you were to pay attention, you would just note that in each of those, this is a, the proper preface is particularly beautiful. Um, I don't know what I have down here for notes, but just some things to emphasize. First of all, it says it's right to give him thanks uh, in, all, in, all pl in all ways and in all places. Does it say something like, I think? At all times and in all places. Um, which, so what we're, what we're actually then saying, let us get, we'll say, let we, it's time, we should give thanks. And then the pastor says in the prayer, we should give him thanks in every circumstance and in every place. There is never a time or any circumstance when we couldn't, even in, not only just in the midst, but for those things and circumstances, give thanks to God. And why? Why is it that in everything in the world we can possibly give thanks, even if it's something awful? It's because of what Jesus has done for us, and that's what then is in the preface. In some way or another, uh, mirroring the particular season, whether it's Advent or Easter or Holy Trinity or something, we're going to be reflecting on the particular force of what Jesus has done for us in that season. So this is always a praise of Christ Jesus, and because of what he's done, I now know that nothing that comes to me comes outside of his precious uh, will. 
and his, his merciful will for me. And then we have that m just really beautiful, and this is in all the prefaces, or the proper prefaces, uh, that, that, that conclusion, I'm at letter I, therefore with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and, uh, and, and saying. Right, so this is still Thanksgiving, but we are now acknowledging that we're not simply praying all by ourselves here. It's not just all, you know, a hundred of us in church, but it's all millions and millions and millions of us because we're, we're here, but we are here with the entire company of heaven. And not figuratively. I mean, yeah, I don't, you, it's not like, oh, isn't that a nice way to think because they pray this and we pray. We really are bold to believe that when we draw near the altar to, uh, of Jesus, that he's there with his body and his blood. I happen to know that, for instance, the saints who have gone to heaven, they're also, very deliberately, the Bible teaches us, they are gathered where? Around, his around Jesus. So they're around Jesus. Right? And we're also where? Around Jesus. Right? So, so it's the same Jesus. And we are, uh, uh, space doesn't really matter here. What, ma what matters is Christ Jesus. So that we are now gathered together with the saints in heaven. I have, I have said before, and I, th I, I think that we need to just take stock of this, that w I, I think it's nice to go visit the cemetery. I mean, li w because the bodies that we've buried in the ground are in fact the bodies that are gonna ra be raised and we will spend forever and ever with this body. So I, I don't know, I'd encourage you to go to the seminary. I'm not saying you have, uh, sem seminary, <laughs> cemetery. <laughs> I, but you don't have to, but it's good, it's right. It's not sinful or morbid or something to go to the cemetery, it's good. But you're not as close at the cemetery even uh, with your loved ones as you are when you're going to the Lord's Supper providing that they, are, that they, that they were Christians. Um, that really is our memorial day in a sense, um, that, w w that, that we're there at, at the Holy Communion with them. And not only them, but angels and archangels and all the company of heaven. We just can't see them. But that's really, a, that's such a small thing. In the Bible, being able to see something, it's really not that. Well, one of the whole points of the Bible is to try to te teach us that seeing things is really not that big of a deal. It's if it's true. Hearing things is far more important than seeing them. And so the truth is that, the, that all heaven is gathered around. Yeah, Carol. So, Pastor, is there a Bible verse that you could lead us to to share that with others? Because that's something that I try to, when someone um, loses someone close to them, I try to explain it to them. Mm -hmm. But is there something more that I can point them to in the Bible that would bring that? You, you can, um, yeah, let me think. You, you, you have the various, like Revelation 7, Revelation uh, 14, I think. Um, which will point out how the saints are in heaven. These are they who are coming out of the great tribulation, uh, meaning they've come from this world, which is the great tribulation, and they're washing their robes in the blood of Christ. They're there in heaven. And who's, who's there with them? Jesus is very clearly. Um, the, what we're pointing out when we get to the Sanctus in a little bit is that th this is the same song as the angels. And so we're joining their song, which is a perpetual song. They kept singing, holy, holy, holy. Um, and so that's how the basis upon which we, we believe that we're worshiping with angels in heaven at this time. Um, but, now, but so your question is, how is it that we would persuade somebody in their maybe sadness that they're around Jesus? Or that when they come to the communion rail, uh, that's where they can be with their loved ones. They don't have to think of them as... I mean, especially those who are kind of um, on the borderline or of their, their faith is, is, is weak. Um, there's a lot of people I know that they're, that's, they, they miss being able to be with that loved one and yeah, to I assure them that when they go to communion, that's the closest that they're going to be with them, that they're actually there with them. I think probably you'll want to pull from the entire theology of Hebrews on this book, on, the, on this um, and I'm a little embarrassed because I can't, I think it's Hebrews 4 and you have it again at 9. But it's, it's the place where it says draw near unto the throne of God. And you'd take a little bit of time, but you'd need to be able to argue that what St. That what Paul there is teaching is to draw near to communion, to holy communion, to the holy things of God. 
And when we, so when we're in church and we're coming to communion, we're drawing near to, the, to Jesus on his throne in heaven. And, um, I'm trying to think of other places that you would get this. Do you have something? Hymn 676. I, and I can't remember. I don't have one in front of me. But, you know, but one of the verses um, for, for all the saints that always comes to me when I go to communion, I think it's verse 6. Um, oh, blessed communion, fellowship divine, we feebly struggle, they in glory shine, yet all are one in thee and all are thine. Yes, particularly. And, and I just feel like I don't, usually there's some <coughs> scriptural things that are listed in the bottom. Yeah, oh. like so it's based on, on the right hand side. So I don't know, you know, if you look at 676 and 7. Anybody who's, who is hearing, um, hearing 676 and sort of clicking like this a little bit at 677. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Uh, Hebrews 12. Okay, good. Um, uh, so the cited verses on that particular hymn are Hebrews 12, Revelation 2, and uh, 14 and 17. Uh, but Hebrews 12 is going to be, uh, let, uh, uh, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, that maybe is the very best one. Um, the great cloud of witnesses are the Christians we know clearly from Hebrews 11. That's all the saints in the Old Testament, since we're surrounded by such a great crowd of, uh, cloud of witnesses. Um, this, I, th I mean, this is, I think, a general thing, but in particular when we come to church. Okay. Yes? Um, just an interesting observation from what you're saying. Um, I don't know if there are any churches in this area, but visiting some um, Lutheran churches in the Midwest, rural churches, I've had a few pastors show that the way the church is built on the, opposite, the outside opposite side of the altar is the graveyard. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. with the idea that, that that same thing that you're talking about, that we're communing, with all the saints every time we go to the Lord's table. So it's just kind of an extension of the altar into the, into the graveyard, which is kind of a beautiful thing. I was trying to predict where you were going, and I, I just missed it. But uh, because, as Lois will remind us, um, these, these Norwegian communion rails, and Dr. Marquardt would teach us too, they would intentionally have sort of an arc, arcish kind of look. And the idea was that you were to envision that this altar then went all the way around and that it was attended by but then you're right I had forgotten about that they would oftentimes have behind the altar the and I'm repeating because you I, you, I just there's a lot of people that didn't hear you behind the altar the, it was not uncommon that that's where the church cemetery would be which too bad we don't have those uh, at least uh, at least around here we don't have church cemeteries anymore I'm not sure how we lost that um, but in the Midwest you'll see it especially in the older churches, they just, we buried our own, and that's where they would be. So yeah, that's particularly beautiful. Okay, um, that whole proper preface is of course working us towards the Sanctus. And that's where we're at now, number 21, letter A. For the second time in the liturgy, at least by my count, we are beginning to sing now with angels. We actually mimic or sing right alongside with the angels and their song. Um, in this particular one, it's Isaiah 6. What was the first time we sang with angels? I didn't write it down here, but what, when, what, when was it? Not holy, holy, holy. Glory be to God on high. And on earth peace, good will toward men. From what? From where? From Luke chapter 2. That's Christmas. The shepherds. Glory be to God on high. Uh, or also known as the Gloria in Excelsis. Yeah. Um, so it kind of is a bookmark, isn't it? Or a, or a bookend. It's bookends in a sense. Uh, but we're picking up this song in particular from Isaiah chapter 6, and, and we, and we could just quote it. How about half the whole Sanctus is a quotation directly from Isaiah chapter 6? Now, let me see what I've said here. This is very significant. So in the same way that Isaiah saw Jesus on his throne in the temple, we confess that he is verily pre present with us in the divine service as well. The same song the angels were singing then, they still sing, and we are joining them. Just, so just maybe just take another step back from this. Isaiah is there, he's in the temple. Isaiah is not a priest, uh, so presumably he's just there attending church that day in some way. There's a roof on the temple, but he says then, um, 
then suddenly I saw the train, the Lord, the Lord on his throne, and the train was coming down into the temple. So is there a roof still there? I guess not because it's way up and there's no roof. <laughs> or there is and he can't see it. But the Lord is high and exalted there on his throne. And there's angels. They have six wings. They, they're flying. They keep covering their faces and so forth. Um, and Isaiah's seeing all this. I don't, know, I don't think other people can see it, but he can see it. Now, it doesn't say, I suddenly saw the Lord fly on in and land on church. Um, it just is that his eyes are open to recognize a reality which is given all the time, but which he just can't ordinarily see. And here now he can see it. Now, what I'm just saying is that that's not different. The, the worship of the Old Testament is not fundamentally different than the worship of the New Testament. That when we come together, we do, it does look like there's a roof up there, and we need roofs because of you know, snow and things. But, but that, in fact, that roof does not keep the company of heaven and Jesus himself from being present with us so that if we, could, if we had eyes to see it, which would require the Holy Spirit, but it's fine, we can believe it, and it's true, that if we had eyes to see it, the train of the Lord's robe would come right down into our sanctuary Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, and his very presence is right there with us. And therefore, when we're praying, holy, holy, it's just really, I want to emphasize this again and try to staple it down into your attention. We are not praying holy, holy, holy to a God 100 million miles away, but to one who is right there with us. Um, so... So the, the words in particular uh, are holy, 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 Lord God of Sabbath, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Hosea and then Hosanna is, is a different uh, component. Um, you then also remember, what, this is what's so beautiful about the liturgy. I'm explaining it all, but the liturgy itself doesn't explain it to death. I explain it to death, but the liturgy doesn't. It depends on just you kind of picking things up and you being educated and Bible literate. The, 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 the liturgy expects that you will know that entire account of Isaiah. And so you remember what happens when he sees the Lord? He is, he says, first, I am undone, or woe is, woe is me, I'm undone. I have unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. In other words, he, he, is, he, is, he is terrified, and what he notes is his sin. Um, I don't know if he's got a pre- disposition that he's going to be called into the prophetic ministry and that's why his lips are causing him trouble because he certainly doesn't just have unclean lips does he <laughs> he has unclean feet and hands and an mi unclean mind and heart also but he notes his lips uh, probably because the Lord is going to call him to use those lips to preach his word and so he has a ten especially tender conscience I, I really can't use these lips for it, but it also could be that he's just been violating the Eighth Commandment and the, and the Second Commandment, and he knows it, and he feels bad. Whatever the case, what then happens in response to, I have bad lips? With a coal, which comes from the altar. More important than the coal is the altar from which it comes. The altar is the place where Jesus himself is foreshadowed to be sacrificed, so the altar is the location of the atoning sacrifice of Christ. So the, that, that, uh, yeah, that hot, hot coal, I don't think it burned him. Like it didn't burn the bush up, the burning bush. It didn't burn his, I don't think it, but it purified him. So that, that purifying coal was laid upon his tongue, and his, in there he was forgiven and therefore commissioned unto useful work by God at that point. Um, now how would that be significant for when we're singing it in the, Lord, in the divine service? Right? God is present. We, 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 of course, have all been absolved. And yet, what is the Lord preparing to do for us? It's not a coal, is it, that he's going to put on our lips. It's the, the very body and blood of Jesus he's going to lay on our lips for our purification, for our, from, from the very body and blood of Jesus for our atonement and for our forgiveness. Uh, the liturgy expects that you're aware of that. That's a significant song. It then transitions to the words, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest. Uh, Blessed is he who comes in the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. And that's from where? You can see it at the, in your hymnal. That's from Matthew 21. 
that also is significant. It's picking up language because you should know what word that was saying. It was saying when? On Palm Sunday, when Jesus, in humility, now this is not in, in great glory because when Jesus comes in his body and blood and bread and wine, simple bread and wine, that's really a humble coming, but it's still Jesus. He's coming into Jerusalem for, for, for his people and their salvation. It's the same thing here. So we are, we are re we're just reflecting biblical language and recognizing that's in fact what's happening for us. We are, this is not a different, entirely different, wildly different thing than what was happening in the Bible. We're just seeing it happen now. So we are, in fact, praying, Hosanna, the Lord save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Who is coming? Jesus. Not on a donkey, but he's coming into our midst very, very soon uh, after the sanctuary. So what other notes do I have that I didn't get yet? Yeah, I think I got everything. Okay, questions up to this point, confusions. I'm going fast, I know, and I wish I could go faster. Okay, quick, the Lord's Prayer, um, letter A. Oh, good. Okay, so I'm going to do this as quick as I can. Why? Because this might be the most controversial part of the liturgy, and I'm going to say it and get on out of here <laughs> um, in conservative liturgical circles. And I have, a, I have a position on this, and it's not universally agreed upon, so I just want you to know that I'm taking a position today, and really good pastors, really good pastors disagree with me on this. Well, that, that's fine. This is not... This is not a matter of specifically a commandment in the Bible or something. We just have different opinions. But um, what in ancient times, entire prayers of quote, commemoration, thanksgiving, self-dedication, and supplication, and the immediate connection with the words of institution were developed. Now I'm just quoting there from, uh, from Luther Reed's book on the, on the liturgy. This is most typically called a quote, Eucharistic prayer. Um, in Luther's time, such a prayer was thought to contribute to our own action in bringing about the body and blood of Christ and, even more important, our re-sacrificing of Jesus on the cross. So this prayer or this canon or it's, it's called an epiclesis or a Eucharistic prayer, this was offered and it was thought that this was making the body and blood of Jesus the body and blood of Jesus. And it was a reenactment. It was our offering up of Jesus' blood to God like in the Old Testament sacrifices. If I, if I don't know how much you know about this, but that was super, super offensive to Luther. More offensive than, um, than what, what, what is it that we call it when the body changes into the, or the b bread changes into the body? More offensive by a long shot than transubstantiation. More offensive than communion in one kind. Remember that in, at that point only the body of Jesus was given out, not his blood. Then Luther disagreed with that. But the most offensive thing that was going on was the sacrifice of the mass. And so these prayers that started piling up after the Sanctus, before the words of institution, our Lord Jesus Christ on the night he was betrayed, all that collection of prayers is called a Eucharistic prayer, and Luther just took a giant eraser or a scissors and chopped it out. And he left one prayer before the words of institution, and that was the Lord's Prayer, and that's it, and then worked right into not our prayers anymore, but Jesus' words, our Lord Jesus Christ on the night he was betrayed. That's all Luther wanted to see. And so he was against the Eucharistic prayer. However, that Eucharistic prayer had, de had developed from centuries of different kinds of usage. And so, you know, in the last 100 years, specifically probably the last 70 or 80 years, a number of modern Lutheran theologians, sophisticated, recognizing that Luther just did a hatchet job uh, and didn't like Luther's liturgical sorts of things, um, wanted to try to add a, a Eucharistic prayer back in. And I disagree with them. I just don't think they should do it. I, I agree with Luther on this. I think it should just be the Lord's Prayer and get straight to Jesus' words at this point. But where, where this gets uh, kind of worked in, or I would say smuggled in, but like I said, really good pastors think it should be restored. I just think they're wrong. But you do see it coming back in at, say, in setting one, for instance. If you would look to setting one, I don't know if you've got it, um, on page 161, um, the, there's a sanctus, sanctus, holy, 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 Lord God of power and might. And when we finish, it says, 
Hosanna in the highest. And then there's a big long quote prayer of thanksgiving. We don't use it. <laughs> we don't use it no. What's, what's the other word for thanksgiving? Eucharist. So this is a Eucharistic prayer, the sort of thing that Luther, what? Chopped. It got ba added back in. And But, you know, Gene, as you correctly note, we don't use it. <laughs> we just skip to where? Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Now you know, hey, what? I don't know if he realizes this, but he keeps skipping that whole big prayer right there. <laughs> well, that's the reason. That's right. Well, it's not a bad prayer. It's just in where it's at has all kinds of historical associations. And, and it's associated, though it doesn't teach false doctrine. It's associated with false doctrine. And so this is one of these places where, where I, I think that this is a mistake to add that back in. And, I, and I'm disagreeing with you know two th a good two-thirds of the professors who taught me about these things. That's right, I know. <laughs> All right, letter B. The Lord's Prayer is the service is in the service of the sacrament. The Lord's Prayer is not a general prayer, but something like a family prayer. Did you notice I said already this is like the little family? Because when we say, strictly speaking, when we say our Father, the only people praying this are are Christians. The Our Father is a is a family prayer. Um, it's 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 got a long history right next to the words of institution in the liturgy. Who should pray this? The pastor or everyone? Uh, this has evolved. If you go back to the um, to the TLH, you t TLH loyalists know that the pastor prayed the prayer all by himself, and then the the congregation concluded with the doxology at the end. For thine is the kingdom, and the, which the organist always played too slow, so it ended up being. And the power, <coughs> and uh, <laughs> um, all those things should snap along. But we don't use it. Why? Because, because you all took the Lord's Prayer back. <laughs> okay. Now, again, here's a friendly disagreement between pastors. Um, a, lot, a lot of pastors are still that are that are liturgical minded and think these things through. Still think that the pastor alone should be praying those words, and the congregation, just like the collect and other prayers, and the congregation should add their amen or add their doxology. And that's the way it is in the in the hymnal. It's in that. It's, that's the hymnal. The hymnal gives it to us that way. Well, guess what? Um, there are times. <laughs> there, there are times when um, when pastors want things to be a certain way and the, and, the, and the laity say, no, we want this back and they're right about it. Um, I was listening to Peterson on this recently and he said, I didn't even know this, um, that the, it was the laity who insisted on a Holy Trinity Sunday. And the pastor said, no, there shouldn't be a Holy Trinity Sunday. We don't have Sundays that just emphasize doctrine, a certain doctrine. We have Sundays that emphasize a, a something Jesus did in his life or something like this with a the laity said, no, we want a Sunday that's devoted to the teaching of the Holy Trinity, and that's where we got Holy Trinity Sunday. <laughs> and guess what? They were right. No pastor disagrees with us this now. The laity, the laity had this one right. And I think it's the same thing here. Gradually, churches are, are taking, are, are, they, they want to say the Lord's Prayer. When they say our Father, they got it memorized, of course. The children should say this prayer. And so I don't have any issue with departing from the hymnal at this point, we all pray the Lord's Prayer uh, together here anyways. Um, and that's, that's how that got that. And I think, I, I, I could be wrong. I bet, you, and I bet you the next hymnal, that's standardized and, and it's, it's never taken away um, from the laity again. But I don't know for sure. Okay, questions before we close for the day? Well, have a happy 4th of July weekend um, and be safe. Uh, the uh, grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.